so, um, haven't really done a live video in a long time, and not something as serious as this, but, uh, kind of wanted to tell my story about the past year, um, been through a lot of changes in my life, um, really taking control of my own self and I've made a lot of discoveries. Um, if we're connected on Facebook, feel f free to share this. Um, I'm going to talk about some pretty personal stuff, but uh, feel free to share this with anyone. Um, it's public. If you, if you can find somebody that you think this is going to help, like feel free to share it with whomever. Um, if you don't know who I am, I'm not really anybody that important um, by the world standards right now. Um, and I honestly don't know if I'll ever be. And I think for the first time in my life, I'm actually okay with that. Um, I have had to go through a journey the past year or so, um, but the past couple of years, give it that context that actually means anything. So I want to start back to where I was a few years ago, and I had tried to live life the way the world wanted me to live it and like I do everything I completely immersed myself in it let myself go reinvented myself to um I guess what we consider the you know die hard and western consumer but uh, it was it was not sustainable um after a good part of my life I just realized I I was not having any fulfillment um, I was struggling with depression anxiety suicide daily honestly like I was having micro or I guess rapid cycle rapid mood cycles all the time sometimes a few times a minute according to experts it was just not good. I had so many layers of anxiety. I now know I actually had no moments of the day or at night actually where I was not uh, experiencing severe anxiety. So everything became pretty relative at that point. It wasn't I was feeling anxious or I wasn't feeling anxious. It was how anxious was I feeling at any given moment. Um, this was wildly destructive and I had you know, gone through all those traditional Western routes of figuring things out, psychologists, neuroscientists, um, all sorts of things. And then as time went on, things were actually getting worse, even though getting the best experts, getting the me best medication, things were changing in a way. It felt like science was struggling to keep up with even identifying that things were changing, let alone providing solutions and this is difficult because at that point really the last thing they have left is sedation um i was taught to think that my brain was dangerous that i was dangerous um despite having suicidal thoughts for over 15 years and only acting on them a couple of times in the beginning then logically learning that it wasn't a valid solution despite having them pretty much daily. That's not something um, a delusional or rational mind does, but we have uh, this massive state of mania that the entire world seems to be in, at least here in the Western world, that um, everything's kind of relative at this point. Absolutes are getting muddier and muddier and actually uh, less... <laughs> absolute and this is very very troublesome um and honestly i don't know exactly what to do there i know exactly what i want to be doing and how i'm going to you know put in my effort but uh, you know 
when it comes down to it, I had to figure out who I was. Um, and that's where I was about three years ago. I was trying to figure out who I was, what I actually needed to be happy. And I had tried everything. I had tried chasing money, chasing thrill and profession and What it came down to is no matter what I was doing, no matter how honestly or dishonestly I was doing um, things, it just I wasn't fulfilled. I wasn't happy. Um, so I just kind of was open to anything at that point, open to really anything. And one person who I was close with at the time was very successful by the world's definition of things. Very, very successful. Um, and it fascinated me how he would talk about things like stoicism, like a 3,000 year old philosophy of, you know, not necessarily chasing happiness, but pushing it away to find happiness within. Um, it's like an extreme version of minimalism and actually what things like minimalism were inspired from but stoicism is by today's examples or to the, by today's standards it's it's probably pretty extreme i mean minimalism um is more about finding that harmony to do more once you find that you know you desire nothing but stoicism promotes the idea of like staying in that and interestingly enough, that resonated with me more than uh, minimalism. I, I got minimalism, but it, it still felt too tempting for me. And this was quite interesting because, uh, you know, stoicism is, it's a tough one to live daily. But for whatever reason, I felt comfortable. Like there's a lot of digging in your own personal dirt, digging up dark stuff and, um, that's weirdly where I felt comfortable because I, I realized my entire life I was focusing on transforming myself. I had been raised with one priority over all others, and that was to work on the mental chores, to um, get right in the head and improve, and... You know, traditionally, getting right in the head means something had to have gone wrong. But now, all you have to do is use electricity for uh, things to go wrong in our heads is what it seems like now um, with all the devices and the gadgets and the ads and, you know, the foods that we have. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't take much to push us into that rabbit hole of delusion, almost to the point where it generalizes the meaning of delusion so much that it loses some of that impact that I think carries the, the stigma. Um, but anyways, I, I pushed down deep into this, uh, um, this valley of stoicism and was getting comfortable with less. Um, not necessarily for, I think, a lot of the reasons people get into minimalism or stoicism sometimes, which is a way to make more. Um, no, like, it was definitely a deep philosophical place for me because I was seeking to stop people pleasing. I wanted to stop seeking validation from others. I wanted to stop caring about what other people thought because... I cared so darn much, I I couldn't even hear my own thoughts. And that is dangerous, because I was losing touch with who I was. And in hindsight now, I, I don't think I ever knew who I was my entire adult life. And I'm finding that there are a lot of other people who could probably say that if if, if they, you know had the the luck and the fortune to figure out what I figured out at any point in their life, any point of their adulthood. I'm talking to some people who are 40, 50, 60 years old who feel like they never knew themselves, which I think plays heavily into the high divorce rate 
for people after they become empty nesters. Like, I think a lot of us learn to become somebody that we want to be, um, regardless of what our nature is. And some people, it's it's so far from what our nature is that the anxiety, the depression, the insomnia, the, you know, those things, they get worse and worse as time goes on. Um, it's almost like the mind-body connection is so deep that, you know, the more things that the general public has experienced for, like, well over a century, like, it's like we're at a point where everything is so augmented that it just disrupts us from within. And when I was on this journey of, I guess, transforming myself, um, I, the only thing I wanted to do, I thought information was going to set my, set me free. I thought knowledge would set me free. I thought knowledge was the source of all power that I needed, but no, the truth I needed did not come from knowledge. It came from listening to myself, which I guess is learning our own personal knowledge, our own personal truth, which I guess is our own personal beliefs. Not the beliefs that are taught to us by others, but the beliefs that you know our own body and our own heart and our own mind teach to ourselves through experience. Not something that is absolute other than in the moment that they're true if that makes sense. And because I know there are many things that are true for me in the moment, then I change, I transform and they become partially true. And as time goes on, this shift happens so much that the things that were true for me a year ago are no longer even close to being true for me now. And when I started to realize that I had spent my entire adult life wanting to be an informational speaker of sorts, you know, this promoter of information, this seeker of information, I sought it out and wanted to share it um, or sell it. I realized that, you know, I had become very, very good at informational speaking, but um, <laughs> I was pretty piss poor at getting people motivated to listen to what I had to say and inspiring people to internalize these things. But I, I rarely got to the point where I got people to sit long enough with their attention to actually get to the point where I realized that not only was I lacking the motivational skills for others, but the inspirational skills to help people internalize uh, the information I got. And this was very deeply troubling for me because when I saw information, it was... I need to share this and um, it became very, very troublesome for me to even want to sell information to others because it was, it was so deeply rooted in me to want to share it openly um, that it was also deeply frustrating when I couldn't figure out how to get people to care enough to listen. This would lead to frustration and just me saying, well, look it up, you know. Or, you know, study it, do it. And I I felt so helpless not being able to help others process the very information that I worked so hard to excel at. That was a learned skill. I am not naturally an informational thinker or speaker or else I would be natural at communicating it. No, what I was was a transformational speaker that... I'd spent my entire life working on me, working on transforming me. So who else would I know how to communicate with but me? Like, I, I only knew how to communicate this information with me. And that wasn't doing me very good with that deep desire to share it. And I often resorted to workarounds, like solving people's problems for them, often for a fee, but most often not not enough um, and all too commonly I would give it away and tell people to expect that indefinitely uh, about a year ago I was completely transformed um, after meeting the love of my life and 
uh, somebody who had been haunting my dreams for almost 20 years um, came into my life in flesh and blood and through a long journey of being acquainted to finally getting to know each other and falling in love and getting married quicker than either of us <laughs> personally wanted, but we knew we needed I started to transform almost from day one of marriage, just that commitment to that loyalty to each other that, you know, is, is not often truly deeply needed in people's hearts um, as much as it is accepted as part of society. And I really don't blame people um, for not seeing value in monogamy anymore. But for me, it was definitely definitely needed deep down in my core in my being I knew I needed a partner and after seeking these out in business and not being able to find it because I didn't need an informational partner I needed an emotional partner somebody to be my anchor somebody to be my sales somebody to carry me when I was drowning and somebody that I could direct when the waters were getting rough. And I found that. And within a few months, I had learned like an eager child at the footsteps of a god, everything I needed to know to improve myself to a status that it was hard to separate what I was becoming from things that I thought were impossible for me and in some parts impossible for other humans. And this was, this was invigorating. It was uh, motivating. It was inspiring that I could finally inspire myself. I could finally look up to myself. <clears throat> And all of this was soaked up like a sponge from the information just flowing off of my partner through her example and her choices to the point where it had taken me to a new plateau that was so far from anything I had ever expected. I did the one thing I knew how to do and that was I communicated with her what I was seeing and where we were going and how what we wanted would not get us we we would not get if we kept on this path of what we knew how to do and we needed to take more risks on ourselves and follow a path that on one hand I had learned from her and on the other hand I had no idea how to know if these things were absolutely true and absolutes became almost somewhat useless in the area of my life that I had to focus on more. And she, she agreed wholeheartedly. She wanted to do that to my utter surprise. And I thought that I would risk losing her, asking her to go on this journey deep into her cells with me. And, um, unfortunately I gave her the information and, she was listening to me just like I was learning from her. But the trouble is, is I didn't know myself well enough to know what is different about me that, you know, makes me special, makes me unique, that others do not always share, including my wife, who is so drastically different than me. I sometimes think we're upside down and backwards from each other. We're completely inside out and we connect on our intense deep desire to communicate no matter what in such deep ways deep levels that it makes many other people uncomfortable um, despite our you know differences in thinking everything had aligned up until we were married and then we were at the same spot. We had finally made it to the same space at the same time. And I thought I would always be needing her help. And now for the first time ever, 
somebody deeply needed my help and couldn't get it from anyone else. And for the first time ever, I realized that I was not an informational speaker. I was a transformational speaker. And using a lot of this terminology that I've learned from Lisa Nichols and her course on speak and write. And it's, uh, it's been crazy because a year ago when I was gifted this course, this amazing blessing in my life to help me figure out who I was, I was listening to the details that mattered most to me because that's what we all do. And I thought, oh, yes, I am, you know, I'm an informational speaker and a transformational speaker. Or I want to be a transformational speaker because, you know, that's what I feel like I'm good at. Um, so I might as well learn how to do that. Um, but I quickly learned, oh, no, you know, I need to be an inspirational speaker um, because it was, you know, even if I could motivate people to listen to me, I had no tools to inspire them to make that change in themselves, essentially selling them on the belief that they can, you know, they can do it. And you know, it's just so different for me because all I need to know is the why and I will do it. I will push myself to the point of destruction to carry that mission home. Uh, most often I need help the closer to the finish line I get. Um, and that can become destructive when I can't motivate people to listen to my why, when I can't inspire people to help me do something that, you know, to them looks like complaining. And unless I was complaining about why I should give up. I was, I was just doing a poor job at motivating and inspiring those around me. So I believe that I was learning to become, um, an inspirational speaker that I was naturally an informational speaker. But what I've learned over the past year is I'm not naturally an informational speaker. I'm naturally a transformational speaker. And that is kind of a hard pill for me to swallow because a year ago when this started, I did not want to be a transformational speaker. I think that was because I'm naturally a transformational speaker and I understood uh, the connotations of that suggestion, the amount of work that would need to go into it because it's it's not enough just to be a transformational speaker. That means you get down into the trenches, into the mud with people and sometimes carry them above your head. even when they're complaining the whole time and knowing that they have the strength to help themselves. They just don't want it. And that's why I thought I wanted to become a motivational or inspirational speaker because I wanted to escape this burden of helping people transform. Because it's so painful. And I didn't want to commit to it completely. I thought I was just too tired of being a sin eater. But in reality, I hadn't truly accepted myself. So I resented my natural skills. I resented that others had used them because I didn't want to be aware of them. I didn't want to protect myself. I just wanted to not bear this cross. So over the past year, I... I've brought it back to basics and I've understood that I needed to start with learning to become a motivational speaker. And I, I learned this by listening to the world around me, listening to how 
my own words were becoming weapons because when you suck away people's motivation by sharing harsh truths and you don't prepare them for them through motivation getting them to opt into the hard truths even if they opt in once it's not enough like they have to opt in every time and sometimes a couple of times before you drop an especially heavy truth bomb on them so I practiced that for a good 10 months and didn't really really feel like I had gotten any good at it until about the end of May and then things changed and my wife had learned everything that I had to teach her on how to help herself the way I had learned the growth mindset and not to say she knew everything I knew but she knew the basic principles of how to educate oneself how to let go of that fear of failure and taking risks and understand the value of banging your head against you know the wall sometimes if your goal is to break through that wall when <laughs> sometimes the hardest thing we have on us is our own head this works a lot better in metaphor than it does in practice like <laughs> Don't suggest people try breaking through literal walls with their with their noggin, but hopefully that paints the picture. And once again, I was called to switch things up. I didn't get the practice at being good at motivationally speaking as I thought I would get uh, for the rest of the year, and I quickly had to shift gears to grow and become an inspirational speaker because... My wife was at a point where she now needed to know what to learn in a reality where there is no one right way to learn anything anymore. So I had to help inspire her because now that she could make it 80% of the way, how would she avoid that pitfall of becoming counterproductive right at the finish line? I mean, I I would get counterproductive right at at the starting line. Like, if I could get my butt up and doing something, I knew I was going to finish it even if it finished me. Um, about one way or another, you know, I wasn't done until something was finished. <laughs> um, and this was what was calling me to become an inspirational speaker, finally. And getting to that point of realizing that You know, it's kind of the mirror of motivational, where if people aren't listening to the motivation, you know, it's not about them, it's about you. But when it comes to the inspirational stuff, I'm realizing it's not about me, it's about them. In flipping that script, it's so easy for me now to entice people with the information and then ramp them up with the motivation to keep hearing and learning but then getting to the part of inspiration I was falling back on more information and <laughs> sucking away all that you know motivation that I had just you know given them um, and was you know it was better for me to walk away than it was to even attempt continuing to talk and I realized this after a couple of weeks and I just dive deep into inspiration and I realize it's not that much different than motivation. It's just in reverse. It's not getting them to believe in what you're sharing with them in the right now. It's getting them to believe in the future that is unwritten. Getting them to believe in themselves, not the information. And it's, it's interesting because... That whole, you know, the student becomes the master. That in Star Wars, the Sith, they 
was it Darth Vader? He flipped that on its head and his ego said, you know, the student has become the master, but <laughs> what he didn't realize is he was, couldn't be further from the truth. And what I realized is I was now sitting at the feet, listening to my master through my wife, waiting patiently through my dropping, fumbling the balls on the inspiration side of things after I had given her the information and then motivated her. And then at the point where she needed to run with it, she would, <laughs> she would listen to me fumble that ball and wait patiently sometimes have to process her own anger or frustration, but always come back to me and work with me and communicate how I needed to communicate differently in that moment to inspire her. And the very next time I would try it and it would work and it was forming these habits. And she told me, at the beginning of June that she was going to need to take some time off to work on herself. I was, what do you mean time off? And that was up to her to define and decide. And sometimes it was, you know, time off from talking to people. Sometimes it was time off from work. Sometimes it was time off from learning things. Sometimes it was time off for me. <laughs> um, but very quickly, I realized it was now my turn to learn and I'm very humbled to be in this process, this cycle that is you know, honestly it's it's charging me things that I didn't think I had the emotional or mental reservoirs to pay for. And all this time I was chasing money, I was increasing my emotional bank size. All this time I thought I was increasing my intellect, I was increasing the capacity of my emotional intelligence. And for the first time ever I'm practicing making withdrawals and realizing I have reserves to do essentially emotional philanthropy so for the first time ever I'm going to need to get used to the idea of asking people to invest in me and I know eventually that will mean asking people to pay for things that come to me naturally but Honestly, I am not surrounded by people that can afford that. So instead, I have to get comfortable at least asking for donations after I help people. And that's, I think, what I'm working on now. Trying to figure out how I can build up the courage to understand that I'm not going to offend people if I just ask for a simple donation. Like, it's not an obligation, it's just a donation. I shouldn't be so worried, but that's the people pleasing. Every single layer I peel back, it's like an onion. I realize like, you know, eventually I'm going to get to that seed and have the choice of whether or not I want to plant more onions or understand more about onions or go deeper and not have these layers to pull back, but it'll have new layers to pull back. Layers that are deeper, ones that maybe aren't as painful as uh, pulling back the layers of an onion. Who knows, maybe geneticists cry when they are studying the genetics of an onion seed. <laughs> maybe I should look into that. Maybe this metaphor goes deeper than I realized, but... Um, <laughs> I'm hoping that, you know, even if it doesn't get easier, I'll get stronger. And I just wanted to put that out there. So right now, if, if you have any advice, if you have any feedback on 
how I can ask for donations. If you, you know, if you could donate to me by sharing this with somebody who you think could benefit from hearing it. Because this, this journey has cost, you know, cost me and my wife greatly. Not as much in financial, but like we've become accustomed to finding happiness at a level of zero that I didn't think really existed. And it's quite interesting to learn to separate our desire for money from, you know, the wisdom of having a security and finding that balance, that harmony, not to get caught up in that, you know, that money lust that, you know, one doesn't necessarily need to be obsessed with money anymore to have that money lust on something, you know, they need to pay for that vice or that escape or those, you know, whatever, like, and it's, it's not everything. It doesn't always cost greatly, but what I feel now is we have so many of them. If we added them all up, we'd be probably pretty surprised that, how much we pay financially and I'm like at this point like letting go of those has let us live more comfortably with our own affordable creature comforts but at this point it's understanding that you know even if I don't believe in or respect money the way I used to I have a deeper level for it now I understand it's a tool it's not a destination it's not a mindset like it's it's a virus of the mind, but understanding it's still a powerful tool in the world we live in, just like a virus can be a powerful tool for, you know, preventative medical care. And without getting into the hot topic of debates on that right now, I'm going to leave that be, but, you know, every single time we, you know, invest in what I used to see as a mental plague, something like (laughs) veganism or nutrition or things like that. I was like, well, that's, you know, that's a, that's a mental plague. That's a delusion, but I'm realizing it's investing in oneself. It's investing in the long term. And I need to believe that, you know, I am worth anything that anyone else can be worth. And if you can help me by sharing advice with me, maybe you can share this with somebody who you think can give me advice on how to, you know, ask for donations. Maybe you know somebody who runs a nonprofit or, you know, does nonprofit fundraising or somebody who can help me understand uh, this mindset of, you know, knowing how to ask for money, but not making about money. It's I realize we can't escape the hypocrisy of the world, but we can escape contradicting them, contradicting ourselves. And that's really important because that's what ties hypocrisy to the right now is the contradictions. It's how we knew, how we know that, you know, you know, the common propaganda of the mid 1800s was that black people had a brain one third the size of other humans, but we knew that in the contradiction once we had the science that it was contradiction contradicting and that you know changed so many things in the right now in the future but in the right now right now it's it's understanding those contradictions are the only way we can practice heuristics on things from the past and things in the future and right now i realize you know my my trying to redefine my relationship with money has turned into a disgust of money and I'm trying to let that go. So if you know anybody who can help me understand how to use and ask for money for help while in the process of doing something good, um, I know I'll be able to help more people. I'll know I'll be able to help more people help more people because honestly, have nothing else left at this point. I've tried every other option that I was told could make me happier than spending the rest of my life in the valley rather than the mountaintop, navigating through the trenches, the murk, helping people learn how to communicate with their enemies so they can help the very enemies that they think 
could have no capacity to understand anything different than their own ego, than their own closed-mindedness. It's the only way I can go from being a sin eater to a sin neutralizer, which at least that way I'm not carrying these things with me, resolving things rather than bottling them up so other people don't have to deal with them. Looking for resolutions rather than avoidances. I want to thank you for watching this. I want to thank you for being a part of this journey. I want to thank you for giving me the pleasure to know you at some point in time. I want to thank you for blessing me with your attention to get to know me. You know, over my life, I've been misunderstood so much. And in my desire to be better understood, to just at least feel listened to, I've been labeled everything from an attention seeker to a narcissist to an egomaniac to somebody with a God complex. But I wish there was some sort of warning label for people like me. It's like, you know, if you have that transformation mindset, beware of the information path as knowledge can be lonely once you get past that point of empowerment. And it's more important to know thyself than to know more. I can attest to that. Thank you.